Hey, welcome. Uh, and first speaker after lunch, this would be a good time. Just close your eyes, lean back, take a nap, and at least for the next 18 minutes. So uh, I am Chris Nicely. I'm uh, affiliated with Next Step Network. It's a nonprofit organization uh, that uh, works with other nonprofits, developers, lenders, uh, city governments, municipalities in incorporating or at least examining manufactured modular housing as an option for their affordable housing situation. We're going to be talking a little bit about how manufactured housing, how modular housing is changing the landscape in many cities throughout the country. Um, we were fortunate back in 2005, our founder and visionary, Stacy Epperson, thought about manufactured housing being in Appalachia surrounded by it, surrounded by the worst examples of manufactured housing you can imagine, and said, you know, there's something about building a home inside with engineered precision that seems to make sense to me. I'm going to try to do manufactured housing right and demonstrate that it can happen and that it's a viable option for affordable housing. At that time, she was executive director of Frontier Housing, an affordable housing HUD certified housing counseling agency in Moorhead, Kentucky. And she said, I'm going to prove this. Our very first customer in 2006 was Lee and Lucille down in the lower right hand corner who still live in this house today and tell everybody they can talk to about their success with manufactured housing and how their thoughts about manufactured housing were wrong. My challenge, Noah's going to talk to us a little bit about it in the next sessions, and we talked to him about it a little bit this morning, is we have to start thinking outside of the box of comfort that we find ourselves in today. There's lots of options out there, and one of the options in affordable housing is factory built. We have to put aside all of our per perceptions stigma associated with that product and think outside of that box and say okay if we do this right how can this make a difference in our neighborhood in our community in our town in our state in our country if the American dream of home ownership is going to survive today and, and you've and I'm not going to belabor this slide today we're talking about and you've heard you've heard about the shortage of housing in general that our society has. We have fewer new units being built today since the 60s, since the 70s, since the 80s. Fewer new units. We have a housing shortage in this country. Many of us in this room can remember the days of construction and home development where we had 2.1, uh, 2.3, 2.4 million units being built every year. Today we're struggling to do a million one, a million two, a million three last year. In an ever increasing demand situation by boomers and looking at the tsunami of demand that's coming at us with millennials. Later household formation, later baby looking for a place of their own they haven't given up on the dream of home ownership it's just out of their reach well how far out of their reach well site built average US Census says $289,000 and it depends on where you peg that on the chart depends on where it is we'll see all kinds of numbers but they're all going to be around this $290,000 $300,000 mark that's the average site built cost this is without land Manufactured housing, 82,000. Manufactured housing represents about 8% of all homes built, new homes built in a year. So the question really comes down to what happens to these people in between? The people that are searching for homes that fall into this category are last time home buyers and first time home buyers, boomers and millennials. Where are they going to realize their American dream for home ownership? And how and what does that look like? Infill opportunities, tons. We, we heard this morning the mayor of Richmond talk about the, the flight of different population segments. 
whites moving to the suburbs, millennials and younger people moving into the cities, gentrifying the cities, blacks moving back into the cities. Well, Brookings Institute suggests that 15 percent of the land in any municipality in 70 major municipalities they surveyed were vacant. Much of this is residential. Okay, what happens to residential land that remains vacant in the municipalities? Well, it attracts crime and blight and vagrancy. It generates little or no tax revenues for the city. It erodes the vibrancy of neighborhoods and the value of surrounding homes. When the value of surrounding homes erodes, what happens to tax revenues? This can be as simple as a revenue model. For, for municipalities. We have to think about how do I repopulate this vacant land in my city? How do I revitalize this block, this neighborhood, this community? How can I do this in an affordable way so people can live close to where they work or at least closer to where they work? This is, I wouldn't say a typical, but an unfortunate example of a vacant lot in a municipality. How would you like to be living next to that? How would you like to wake up in the morning and find a chair or a couch thrown in that set on fire? Urban infill and suburban infill is a challenge on many, many levels. There's little availability in an urban infill situation for multiple sites on a multiple block that attracts a developer that has crews that could go in and develop. That's one thing. Multiple sites, lots of land, multiple opportunities for development, tough. If there was an interest, but there's no interest. There's no interest, not only in urban infill, but affordable housing by major developers. Remember the average cost price as a developer I'm interested in $300,000 and above in a tract subdivision that I can develop. Money's better, control of my subs are better, control of my market and my message is better, all of those things better. Scattered lots are, are a nightmare for a developer. And if you happen to find a builder that's local, that has an interest in, in in the scattered lot situation, guess what? No skilled trades. Uh, anecdote, I'm building a house in Dallas, Texas, where I live. Our offices are in Louisville, but we have people in DC and Knoxville and Dallas and other places in the country. And I walk on the job site and I said, uh, where's Dirk? He was my builder, my general contractor. Where's Dirk? Oh, he's down in Mexico. I said, well, this is a great time to take a vacation. And, and the, the carpenter says, no, no, he's not down there on vacation. He's looking for subs. That's the level of shortage that we're experiencing in this country. Can't find skilled labor. In a suburban situation, lower develop, low development er, developer interest in affordable. Why should I make 20 when I can make 45? Why should I sell a $170,000 house when I can sell a $250,000, $300,000 house. Helps my revenues, helps my profit, keeps my people paid, keeps my people working. Contiguous lots makes it easier to develop. All the things that are associated with that in a suburban situation, infill, is a, is a challenge, is a challenge. Challenges in using manufactured housing. Every one of you have your own image of what manufactured housing. You, when you came to this conference, if you came from a suburban area, you drove by yesterday's example of manufactured housing. However, anytime you can get zoning involved in the conversations early on and demonstrate what houses built in a factory look like, the better your chances of success. Initially, they'll pull out of the conversation because of the stigma. When you educate and train and, and sensitize them to what the product can be today, they lean in and start offering solutions. We see that time and time and time again. But we've got, we've got 
to be zoning on aesthetics and not building codes as long as building code delivers the same results. Okay? Think about that. Two, restrictive or unavailable financing. Our next uh, one of our speakers uh, in this first segment from Fannie is going to talk about efforts under duty to serve that they are undertaking in the manufactured housing industry, not, not only to participate, but to expand the marketplace. And that's very, very exciting for manufactured housing, but even more exciting, that's exciting for home ownership. Low down payments, competitive rates, competitive terms. He'll tell us all about this, but it's very exciting what's happening. Lower appreciation, recent studies have proven that to be untrue. If you site the house properly, if you maintain the house, when it's time to sell, you will see similar appreciation as a site built. Now, this is our perception. I'm not saying this isn't out there. What I'm saying is it's 50 years old or older. Okay? The fact that these houses are still there 50 years is, in a sense, one statement of longevity. But this is the perception. This is reality. Any of you that sat through uh, Paul Fortenberry's presentation from Clayton, they have, a, they have a dog in the hunt. I get that. They have a stake in this. But this is the new manufactured home that we're talking about. These are HUD code homes. HUD code. There's not one of us in this room that wouldn't live in one of these homes. $179,000 to $199,000. One was just appraised at $195,000. This is today's manufactured homes. The advantages of factory built, real simple. When you're building 40,000 houses or 10,000 houses or 15 or 5,000 houses, when you go to GE and say, I'm going to put an entire suite of appliances in each home that I build, including a refrigerator, do you think they get the very best price possible? I would guarantee you that they do. So, materials purchased in bulk. There's a controlled construction environment. If it rains outside, guess what? People show up for work. They come in. They get a fair wage. They get, <laughs> they get benefits. Okay? Independent contractors that are coming to your site, they typically don't have benefits. These guys have benefits and a competitive wage. They're skilled and trained in every facet of home building, home construction, and they do that over and over and over again. Proven to work with cars, with Henry Ford, it works effectively with home building as well. Rapid completion of once the home gets on site, I think Paul said today they'll build a house as little as one day. Well, that's a low-end shade and sheltery home. I get that, okay? But what happens is these houses are built in five to six days, five to eight days typically. Five to eight days, we build a house and deliver it to site. Eliminate waste. We've talked about this before. Very exciting stuff. But more advantages for the buyer, controllable costs, faster move in, all of those things, and an appreciating the asset. Real quickly, cost associated with this, manufactured home, $57 a square foot versus $108 a square foot. That's without land. Some people look at that and say, yeah, but you don't have land in there. Land's in there. Land's been taken out, I'm sorry. Land's been taken out. So that's very exciting. This is a price index for homes, site-built homes and manufactured homes. It shows the pricing parallels each other regardless of how they're built. Freddie Mac, I'm going to let our friend from Fannie uh, tell us a little bit more about this, but this is exciting. The most exciting part of this is allowing site-built comps. That's a game changer. And getting appraisers to understand how to do that, that's a major challenge that's being worked on. It works in San Bernardino, California, where a resident of a neighboring house stood in front of the city council and begged them to allow us to put HUD-coded homes in their neighborhood. It's working in Tampa Bay, Florida, that was an empty and deserted development that crashed during the recession that's now being repopulated with manufactured factory-built housing. It works in New Orleans, Louisiana, in the Lower Ninth Ward, where 60 to 70% of those lots 
are still vacant in the Lower Ninth Ward. Katrina impact is still there. 60 houses going in there to try to revitalize a whole community. Moorhead, Kentucky, where this idea started with Stacy Epperson back in 2005. Cincinnati, Ohio, where a factory once stood on a city block that now holds dozens of factory-built homes with families living in them. Phoenix, Arizona, where desperate neighborhoods are now finding affordable housing for all kinds of people. Knoxville, Tennessee, we talked and showed that before. Gulfport, Mississippi demonstrates the flexibility of the elevation aesthetics that can emulate whatever neighborhood they're in. So think outside of the box, reject the myths, insist that manufactured housing be a part of the affordable housing discussion, insist on it. This is today's manufactured housing. Let's zone for aesthetics and use, and as long as the building code delivers the product, let's talk about not worrying about whether it's HUD or IRC. Let's make affordable housing available in our cities so that our first responders, our teachers, and others can live close to their work. Guys, I'm Chris Nicely. That's all I have to say. Well, not quite, but if you want to hear more, find me tonight or later on. Thank you very much.